Canada and good afternoon to our colleagues from UK and other parts of the world. It's my sincere pleasure to host this wonderful event today. I am your host, Rakesh Kumar Khanna, Senior Advocate practicing in the Supreme Court and High Courts in India. I am the former president of the Supreme Court Bar Association. And prior to that, I have also served as the additional Solicitor General of India. Currently, I am an appointed member of the Executive Committee of the Supreme Court Legal Aid Committee. And I am also certified mediator by the Supreme Court of India. Most of you may already know my co-host, Mr. Steven Thiru. Mr. Thiru is a senior litigation lawyer based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He is the vice president of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, Australasia Hub. He is also vice president of the Law Asia, uh, the Law Association for Asia and Pacific. And he has also served as the former president of the Malaysian Bar in the past. Mr. Thiru will be delivering the welcome address today. My co-host, Mr. Rajiv Datta, is senior advocate and mediator at the Supreme Court of India. He is a former vice president of the Supreme Court Bar Association, and he will be moderating today's session. Lastly, my co-host, Mr. Arunashwar Gupta, who is a senior advocate practicing before Supreme Court of India and the head of the Sports Dispute Resolution Center of India, will be giving the word of thanks. Friends, the mediation center in the Supreme Court of India was started 10 years ago when the first batch of 40 lawyers were trained by the center. Last year, another batch of 50 lawyers were trained and this initiative breathed new life into the center. Continuing ahead in that spirit, we, the mediators at the Supreme Court of India, along with Commonwealth Lawyers Association and Youth Bar Association of India, have started these international webinar series on post-COVID mediation to help chart the path of the future. In our very first webinar of the series, we had approximately 1,500 registrants. And as of date, that webinar has more than 28,000 views on the YouTube. The second webinar of the series focused on resolving instead of adjudicating disputes. This again was a very well received and was huge success, having over 1,700 registrants and several thousand views on the YouTube. Besides these international webinars, the Supreme Court mediators, along with Youth Bar Association of India, have also conducted a summer school workshop for law students. In this workshop, we conducted a series of 11 lectures on the process and procedures of mediation. I would also like to mention one last noteworthy initiative that we the mediators of the Supreme Court of India have recently initiated. We have begun to conduct a bi-monthly lecture series as a part of our effort to continuously updating ourselves with the latest developments in the field of mediation and refresh our mediation skills. The next lecture in this series is scheduled for 22nd of this month. Coming to today's topic, I believe that the basic philosophy of the sports lies in the sportsmanship of the players and other stakeholders. Their virtues such as fairness, having a positive attitude, self-control, giving one's best efforts, having an accommodating nature, putting in one's best efforts, not indulging in un unnecessary arguments with the opponents and officials, displaying honor, discipline, kindness, resilience, perseverance, etc truly ties in with the essence of mediation. Furthermore, today, sports have become an industry involving numerous players, officials, sports bodies, and other stakeholders. The issue of discussion today assumes a greater importance when it comes to resolving the disputes between these parties. The dis to discuss some of these important aspects Operating in the world of sports, we have a highly distinguished panel of internationally acclaimed judges, players, and mediators amongst us today. 
I'm not taking time to introduce my panelists. That will be done by my co-host and the moderator, Mr. Rajiv Datta. With these words, I request my co-host, Mr. Steven Theru, to give his welcome address. Thank you. Mr. Steven, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Mr. Kana. Distinguished panel members, ladies and gentlemen, greetings and welcome uh, to this webinar organized by the mediators of the Supreme Court of India, the Sports Dispute Resolution Center, and the Youth Association of India. May I, at the, at the very outset, on behalf of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, uh, express how pleased we are uh, to be a supporting organization and to associate ourselves with this important webinar. As you've heard, this is in a, it's a series of webinars that have been very successfully organized with a reach that spans the width and breadth of the world. I wish to welcome all the panel members uh, who will be individually uh, recognized and uh, inter introduced by the, the moderator later. And I, I, I wish to personally uh, convey my thanks to them for setting aside their time and the effort uh, that, that they put in to contribute uh, to this event. And of course, I wish to welcome you, all the attendees, the many attendees that we have who are online, who have taken time uh, to, to attend and to participate uh, in this webinar. I, I just like to share something with you. Uh, we, we had uh, what, what is known as a dry run yesterday uh, with, with uh, the uh, panel members in preparation uh, for this webinar. Now, if that dry run is an, any indication of what you are about to, to receive and witness today, then I must tell you, you are really in for a, a treat. The enthusiasm, the level of preparation, and the, the equity to, the, to the, uh, the issues that I, I heard and saw last night was truly impressive. And we, we are really in for a very good seminar today. Ladies and gentlemen, the scope of mediation in sports uh, disputes uh, is something that is uh, a, a contemporary matter, a matter that is important and relevant. The experts that we have today in the panel will give you their views based on their diverse, indeed diverse knowledge and experience. And, and you'll, 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 you'll see that when they, they speak and, and from the different viewpoints that they have. And they of course cross jurisdictions as well. And so you'll see the different approaches that have been taken in their respective jurisdiction. If I may say so, it's not often that you have this opportunity to hear such a collection of experts giving their views based on with their views coupled with their varied experience. You know, there are, there are many downsides uh, to this uh, pandemic, and we all know that, uh, and, and many of us can go on and on about it. But if there's one silver lining in it, it is this. It is, in, it is improve the connectivity that we have throughout the world. Many of us would not have been able to participate in a webinar like this uh, 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 and get speakers of this quality under one roof uh, for one event if we were to do it physically. The costs, the travel, all these are prohibitive factors. But today, perhaps because of this pandemic, here we are able to actually connect and, and that is something that I think uh, we should be grateful for. And we must, in that spirit, take full benefit of this webinar. The other aspect of this, uh, the, this webinar, and it, which, is must, which must not be lost, is again, perhaps a bit of an offshoot of the pandemic that, that we are going through. Uh, in many of our jurisdictions, uh, court proceedings are in fits and starts. Uh, we are not able to practice and appear in the courts as we have be, have been in the past, and you are you 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 have increasingly demands on clients that they should that there should be some way in which the disputes can be resolved, an alternative dispute resolution mechanism. So in that spirit and in that way, you see that mediation assumes prominence and importance, perhaps never before, not just in sports dispute resolution, but almost in every area of dispute. So many, many a lawyer today is cooling himself or herself afresh in mediation and preparing themselves to, to, to be able to mediate and act as mediators or 
represent clients in mediation. That is something I believe should not be lost. Uh, although we are in a very specific uh, discussion today, but that underlies our discussion, underlies the new normal, if you like, in the way in which we practice law. That's really all I, I want to say uh, as a part of the welcome. I, I do realize that I stand in between, between you and a great webinar. And you know, uh, the matters I've raised are just minor matters and there'll be wiser minds who would come and contribute uh, to the substance of this uh, uh, webinar. But before I go, I just wish to make a small marketing pitch for the CLA. The Commonwealth Lawyers Association would have our annual conference next year in the Bahamas in September next year. And we are planning still for a physical uh, conference uh, to, uh, to, to have as many of you come and join us there. And there would be room for mediation and scope uh, and sports law uh, in the, in the uh, program that we have planned for, for the, the conference. So I wish you a good uh, webinar today. And, and uh, I, I know you will have a wonderful time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Rakesh Ji, and of course, Stephen, for the, the kind words, and also the distinguished panel here, and all the participants. We are actually in for a very, very exciting evening. Let me, let me, let me tell you at the outset. We, we have a stellar cast of speakers today for you. And it will be a, it will be a very, very exciting evening. And let me also add that amongst the sessions that we have had so far, we have had a very, very exciting season. And uh, as you have already been told, uh, despite the, the, the manner in which the whole world has come to a standstill, we have planned these, these webinars to, give, to take us forward and make us learn more and more about whatever subjects we want to indulge in. And uh, at the outset, I want to say this is, this is really an international webinar and we, the speakers we have today are those who are absolutely giants in the field of arbitration and of course, sports mediation. All over the world, they have, uh, they have practiced and they have learned and they have communicated in, in, in these subjects to such an extent that you will very soon learn. And therefore, I don't want to say anything more. The subject that you know, the scope of mediation in sports disputes is a subject which is fairly, uh, 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 as far as India is concerned, is, is, is a new subject. But as you all know, sports disputes majorly evolve around team selection, funding, doping, disciplinary measures, governance of federations, validity and implementation of government policies, etc. And sports has its own culture, ethos, philosophy, interest, etc. Now, let me at, the, uh, uh, at this stage, straight away, without wasting any time and coming in the way of the speakers, let me introduce you to the first speaker that we have today evening. The first speaker is Derek Murray. Derek Murray is a, is, is a world-renowned sports person, as you all know. He's a former West Indies cricketer who has served as a diplomat in the Foreign Service of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Murray has also worked in the financial services industry in the United Kingdom and in the Trinidad and Tobago. An alumnus of Queen's Royal College, Port of Spain. He studied at Cambridge University where he was a cricket blue and at the University of Nottingham from which he graduated with a BA in industrial economics and where he also received a lifetime achievement award. As a cricketer, Mr. Murray played 62 tests from 1963 to 1981 and was vice captain of the West Indies team that won the 1975 and 1979 Cricket World Cups. Derek is also an accredited mediator. Mr. Murray has been recently appointed as a Trinidad and Tobago's High Commissioner to Jamaica 
and is the current chairman of the Commonwealth Advisory Body on Sports. Let me invite you, Derek, please. We are all very anxiously waiting to hear you. So please uh, come forward and <laughs> give us your, your, your uh, 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 learnings on this topic so that we can be educated and also enjoy this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Dutta, um, uh, for that introduction. And also, um, at the outset, let me thank uh, the, the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, uh, the Youth Bar Association of India, and the Sports Dispute Resolution Center uh, of India uh, for affording us the, the opportunity to discuss uh, what uh, is becoming a, a very fascinating topic. Um, I also thank uh, Justice Kana and Mr. Thiru for their kind words of, of welcome. So um, while we always consider sport for its values in terms of sportsmanship and all the rest that, that goes with it, um, we do, unfortunately, have far too many disputes uh, arising in, in sport uh, that, that do need resolution uh, if we are to uh, enjoy uh, the, the benefits of, of sport as, as we all love. And, and I think that's the, the important thing about entering into discussions about sport, that it is propelled by the, the passion and the love that everyone has for sport. And it plays a very special role in, in our lives. Uh, and, and certainly I'm biased because I was actually a participant, so I have it from a, a different perspective. But when we look at the, the disputes that threaten sport, we need to find ways to, to resolve that in terms of uh, being able to employ uh, processes of, of resolution that will maintain uh, what is fundamental to the laws of, of any sport, uh, which is the spirit of the game. Uh, something that, that is unwritten, but everyone who participates feels acutely. Uh, mediation is, is what we are uh, discussing today, and uh, I, I will use that, that definition on, on the screen, uh, which is a structured interactive process uh, to assist um, disputing parties in reaching a settlement. Um, and the important thing is that mediation provides an opportunity for the, the parties uh, to fashion the solution as the mediator moves through. The, the, the process. But in many ways, the philosophy of mediation is the very antithesis of that of sport. Sport is played basically to win. Uh, and therefore, uh, when you come to dispute uh, resolution, uh, usually the party's instinct is to win. To, to win their point. And the great thing about mediation is that simply by choosing mediation as, as the process, and, and remember, mediation is a voluntary process between the um, opposing parties. Uh, it allows uh, for um, negotiating, for changing positions, and it puts the mediator uh, as simply, and, and I use the term guardedly, the facilitator of the resolution. And it is the parties that have to move their positions um, in, in order to, to function and, and fill, full, fulfill the need for, for a resolution. When we examine um, the competitiveness of, of sport, we, we recognize that while sportsmen play to win, 
they want to play on a level playing field so that within the, the game, within the, the sport, there are usually uh, very uh, conspicuous judges, facilitators for the game itself, whether they be the, the referee, uh, the umpires, uh, in, in whichever sport, football, boxing, cricket, netball, where, wherever we go, we have people who, um, as sportsmen, you learn to accept the, the word of, of the umpire, the decisions of the umpires as, as the game progresses and, and goes along. Um, notwithstanding, uh, nowadays we have all the electronic um, assistance for the, the referees and, and judges and so But very often um, it is a question of the interpretation of the rules and regulations there are very subjective decisions made throughout a game, whether it's a foul, whether it's offside, whether it's a handball. You, you know, you look through all the games and you recognize that the participants themselves learn from a very early stage in, in their careers that they have to accept the um, decisions of the adjudicators. And so mediation, is an extension of, of that. And therefore, choosing the mediator, choosing uh, the facilitator for the process of, of mediation, what that dispute may be, um, requires first a mutual agreement as to um, the acceptability of that facilitator. Uh, so requiring that facilitator to, to be trusted, to be held in esteem, uh, and also one who understands the, the requirement, not just for arbitrating a, a decision or, or a point, but actually encouraging uh, a movement of, 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 of people's um, positions and therefore looking at the, the compromises. So whereas you may have an issue that is going to be mediated and, and it's usually a, a conflict between opposing administrators possibly or you know, players um, and officials having a difference of opinion about access to um, facilities and, and resources, um, athletes uh, versus the, the controlling body of a sport, whether it's an, an international uh, body or whether it's an internal national matter. Uh, and, and whether it, it's to do with uh, contracts, scheduling of events, um, restraint of trade, it's all a question of how do we manage that, that process. Um, and then there are other issues. Uh, and and we, we talk about selection, and with, which is almost uh, a very basic um, requirement of uh, putting out teams, uh, selecting competitors to take part in international or regional games. And therefore, it is always um, a question of the, the subjectivity of the people put in those responsible positions. And it often looks, whether it's through the National Olympic Committee, whether it's a, an International Athletics Federation, etc., that those interpretations of how um, these selections come about, whether they are done through nepotism, cronyism, etc. It, it's the perception of how these things are done, which, which creates in the participants' minds or in the minds of, of, of anyone on, on the periphery, uh, it, it creates angst, it, it creates anxiety, it, it creates situations which are not conducive to what sportsmen want uh, in terms of being able to compete on a level playing field. But while 
there will be a headline um, issue, whether it's poor financial management, whether it's uh, poor team selection, whatever. There will be other issues related to that, which a skillful mediator, rather than strictly an arbitrator, can introduce subtly into the conversation to draw out uh, those issues, whether it's, it's uh, an issue of gender bias, racial prejudice, um, the, the safeguarding of, of athletes, very delicate, sensitive subjects, which may not feature as, as a official headline issue, which um, we want to talk about. We haven't come here to talk today about racial prejudice. So we want to deal with it as a, an issue on the field of, of play uh, or um, concerned with the, the conditions of uh, rules and regulations and interpretation. But it is a real, um, very serious, very sensitive, uh, very important uh, issue that has to be addressed at, at some point. And then there are the wider issues as well. Because as, as we all know, uh, sport is, is a catalyst that can help nations uh, contribute to the achievement or attainment of the sustainable development goals. And, and there are so many things that, that go around sport that need to be addressed. And it's very often uh, difficult to find uh, where is, is the best place um, to, to address those, those issues. So, uh, just to, to mention a couple of the, the, the topical uh, issues uh, of, of the day, um, and again, I, I know that Louise will, will talk much more about this um, late, later on uh, when we talk about uh, bodies like the Court of Arbitration for Sport, which in, in years gone by has been um, considered the, the final arbitrator uh, of, of decision. So um, very much like some of, of us would be accustomed to, to matters going to the Privy Council or something like that in, in a legal sense, you have the Court of Arbitration for Sport. But let me just use two um, things as, as examples at, at differing scales. Um, there is the issue of um, Casta Semenya, uh, the, the middle distance athlete from, from South Africa, uh, and the recent decisions, without going into to the, the legalities of, of the decision, etc. Uh, the perception uh, is that the decision A uh, favored the ruling body, uh, in this case, the Athletics Federation, uh, but also there are the underlying issues that is it racial, is it of other issues that, that played a part in it. The main thing is that that decision would prejudice the way people now look at the court of arbitration for sport. Is it something to, that arbitrates and, and regardless, is it something that has a, a systemic uh, bias in favor of the, the ruling body? And I then use on a much smaller scale, which many of you may not have heard about, uh, an issue with FIFA. Um, not always my favorite body, although um, a sport that I, I love to, to watch. But FIFA recently introduced a normalization committee uh, and suspended Trinidad and Tobago's football. With, again, without going into the uh, whys and wherefores, when the Trinidad and Tobago Football Association that was being removed 
from it, its administration. They chose to bring the matter to the to CAS. However, CAS imposed a penalty, or sorry, not a penalty, imposed costs on the Trinidad and Tobago Football Association, $60,000. FIFA had to pay nothing towards the cost of the arbitration, mediation, whatever was the, the dispute resolution. Immediately, therefore, it smacked of bias. Why should the, the Football Association, which is bringing a matter to CAS for redress, have to pay for the costs of the thing, but not FIFA, who is the, the other party? So regardless of the, the rules, regulations, the laws, the way that, that CAS operates, it then uh, gives the impression that we're talking about the big guy and the little guy. Uh, and the little guy just accepts what the big guy does and, and moves along and, and mustn't say anything. Otherwise, you, you fear suspension. But the perception of the arbitrating body or the body that should be conducting mediation in, in such an issue uh, tends uh, to be seen uh, certainly in, in the Caribbean and, and some other parts of the world, as, as Western-centric. Uh, so again, they have different rules and regulation. I, I always think um, and uphold uh, the uh, beauty of, of Usain Bolt's performances over the years. And I understand that he has been the most tested athlete for drug testing ever. Uh, which again seems to suggest that the authorities, the establishment as such, is looking to ensure that such an athlete is not allowed to uh, go through a, a career um, without saying, you can't be so good, you have to be taking drugs because you are not from the, the establishment. So again, I, I throw that out and um, as maybe why not just seeking mediation, but seeking the body to conduct the mediation and then the individual who is chosen as the, the facilitator, um, which, which uh, goes to show that the preferred method of resolution for me would be mediation, especially for sport, where, as I said at the outset, the rules must take into account the, the spirit of the game. Um, and what is so important after the result is the relationship between the opposing parties to the dispute going forward. Because it's, it's the only way we can learn, we can have continuity, and have stability in sport. At the end of the day, even the athletes, as much as they want to win, they want to win within the rules. They want to believe that they've just not won an event or a game or a match, but that they did it on merit. They deserve uh, to be esteemed, and they want to show respect for the other participants, the other co competitors. And so what we are aiming for is not just achieving harmony, good sportsmanship, but actually aiming to encapture the Corinthian ethos. Again, I, I throw that out for your consideration and I look forward to um, the contributions of my uh, esteemed colleagues on, on the panel. Uh, so thank you very much for, for having me and I hope we have a very productive day. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. And I must say uh, your whole speech uh, was also propelled by passion. And uh, what a brilliant, uh, you know, uh, 
expose on 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 all the aspects of mediation and uh, especially uh, your your uh, comments that the players they are they are they are they learn it's 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 in the dna they learn to respect the empire and and it's the, it's it's the attitude of play to win on a on a level playing field that is that is what is, what what impassions them and if they succeed and they learn that it was not a level playing field it would it would be uh, uh, not so welcome to them and sports is a catalyst to sustainable development what 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 an energetic thought i mean it's it's something simply so marvelous and of course uh, i think uh, the next speaker that we have uh, is 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 uh, is luis j really uh, luis uh, let me introduce you uh, luis is a barrister who specializes in sports law and international arbitration she represents clients in regulatory and disciplinary matters before domestic and international tribunals ms reilly also sits as an arbitrator she represents ireland on the exit panel of arbitrators of world bank in washington dc she is the uh, the uh, washington dc is the irish alternate member of the icc international court of arbitration in paris and is a member of the panel of arbitrators and mediators of sports resolution in the united kingdom ms reilly is regularly appointed by international sports bodies to investigate allegations of wrongdoing she is a member of international weightlifting federation independent member federation sanctioning panel Ms. Reilly is chair of the board of International Biathlon Unions Biathlon Integrity Unit, which she puts the sports of biathlon at the forefront of good governance in international sports. She is a board member of Paralympics Ireland. Ms. Reilly is adjunct associate professor of law at University College Dublin. She is also held positions as adjunct. as assistant professor of international dispute resolution at trinity college dublin and visiting professor in international arbitration at western law school ontario canada prior to returning to private practice ms reilly was managing counsel and head of mediation at the court of arbitration of sports in lausanne switzerland she began her career as deputy counsel at the icc international court of arbitration She is a former judicial intern in the United States District Court for Central District of California. Ms. Reilly is a graduate of Trinity College Dublin, the Honorable Society of Kings Inn and Stanford Law School. While at SPILS Fellow at Stanford, she conducted empirical research on the role of arbitration in resolving business and human rights disputes. Ms. Reilly, we are so proud to have you here today. and uh, i know you uh, everybody is is really waiting to hear you and after the speech that derek gave and the passion that he drove in i think we are absolutely ready to hear you thank you very much thank you very much mr dotta and thank you for that very kind um introduction i will hope to but i'm not sure i'll be able to match derek in his enthusiasm and and uh, passion so thank you very much derek i i very much enjoyed your um your contribution before i i turn to kind of the the crux if you like of what i'm going to discuss just to address maybe or to comment on on some of the very interesting points which derek raised um one of them being whether there is systemic bias at the court of arbitration for sport um i suppose my gut reaction to this is no um i think if you look at decisions of the caf and it would be a very interesting empirical study to do to really go through each decision and find out statistically in what statistics did the cas find for or against the sports body the international federation um i don't have those stats i'm not sure they're available but i think even just to look at recent decisions of the cas so three decisions that come to mind immediately were decisions issued in september 
by the CAS against three biathletes or in which three biathletes took appeals to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Those cases were taken against the International Olympic Committee, which of course is one of the foremost sports bodies internationally. And it's interesting to see that in those, there were three cases taken, three individual cases. And in those three cases, the CAS ruled for the athletes in two cases. So against the IOC in two cases and against the athletes in one case. So for the IOC in, in one case. So based on, I mean, that's not obviously any kind of empirical <laughs> study, but there it's just a recent example of where the CAS ruled against the IOC in two cases and for them in one. Um, but it is, look, it, it, it's a very interesting point. And I think it is something that will continue to be discussed, um, particularly when you look at the structure of, of the CAS and the international federations and the power they hold in the field of international sport. Um, but that's, as I said, just a, a brief comment for what it's worth on that point. The, the second kind of very interesting point, which Derek raised, which I'd like to just to briefly comment on, if I may, is a perception that the CAS is Western centric. Um, and I can fully appreciate and understand this in circumstances where the CAS court office is based in Lausanne, Switzerland, where the seat of arbitration for every arbitration is Lausanne, Switzerland. So the underlying procedural law is invariably Swiss law, apart from some exceptions. Um, again, there, I think the CAS um, has taken steps. And I, I say this from my own, my own experience. I don't obviously speak on behalf of the CAS, but I think if you look at steps the CAS has taken in the last number of years to, to try and be more geographically representative. So for example, if you look at the list of 400 or so arbitrators, they come from regions all around the world. They represent 87 countries from around the world. Um, the CAS, although the headquarters are in Lausanne, the CAS has established alternative hearing centers in Abu Dhabi, in Kuala Lumpur, in Shanghai, and in, in Brazil, I'm not sure if it's in Rio or Sao Paulo in, 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 in Brazil, but again, if you like, efforts made by the CAS to be a more global offering, if you like, to the users of the, of the service. But again, it's, it's a very interesting point raised by Derek. And again, it's something that I think um, will continue to be a point of interest and of discussion. In terms of what I hope to contribute um, in the brief time in which I'll speak to you today, what I'd like to look at first is just to give an overview of the CAS mediation rules. I think when I you know, go through briefly what the rules set out, you'll see a lot of the principles which Derek referred to are enshrined in the, in the CAS mediation rules. And in the second part then, I'll just go through a couple of examples of mediations I was involved in, of sports mediations I was involved in, and the takeaway learnings I, I got from those, from those disputes. So just looking first at the CAS mediation rules, and these rules are available on the CAS website. They're effective, the, the rules are in effect as of the 1st of January, 2016. So similar again to kind of the general principles of mediation, mediation for the CAS is non-binding. It's an informal procedure based on the party's good, good faith attempt to negotiate. So really you need to start from a place where the parties are both in good faith attempting to negotiate a settlement to their dispute. The CAS rules specify that the mediation is for the resolu resolution of contractual disputes. So where you have a financial amount in dispute, the rules specifically exclude disciplinary disputes, such as doping issues, match fixing, corruption. Although there is a caveat there that the CAS rules say in certain circumstances, the parties may agree to submit such disciplinary issues to CAS mediation. So the rule is disciplinary matters are excluded, but there is a caveat that in some circumstances and what those circumstances might be, I suppose, is a matter for debate. In terms of who gets to decide your, or help you resolve your dispute, the CAS has a list of mediators. So they maintain the list. I think there are perhaps around 60 mediators on the CAS list, again, coming from various different parts of the world and they're available to act as mediators on the understanding that of course, all mediators are impartial and, and independent of the parties. And really the role of the mediator is to identify the issues in dispute. So to help the parties whittle down what are the issues in contention between them, to facilitate discussion, and also a, a, a important feature of CAS mediation, which isn't available under all the rules is that CAS mediators specifically have 
the role to propose solutions. So they identify issues, they facilitate discussion, and they have that power under the rules to actually propose solutions to the parties. Now, of course, they're proposals only, they're not binding. The, the, the mediator doesn't decide a case. He or she simply tries to find a resolution with the parties. It's interesting to see how these run in practice. Mediators, again, under the CAS rules, have the power to communicate with parties individually. So one of the golden rules of arbitration by contrast is that arbitrators cannot have one-sided communication with the parties. In mediation, the situation is different. In mediation and in CAS mediation, the mediator has that power to have one-sided communication with the parties. And that's very important and that's very useful because it allows the mediator in advance of any mediation meeting to have these conversations with parties, to build up a relationship of trust and to find out where are the parties. The parties may have an opening position vis-a-vis -vis their opponent, but really it gives the, the mediator an opportunity to, to figure out where do areas of concession lie and also to try and establish what are the interests. So the parties may have very fixed positions but really what's their outcome? What's their end goal? What are they trying to achieve? And is there a way to think about the dispute in a broader way that will allow parties come close to their ideal outcome, if you like? Um, the process is confidential, as, as most mediations are. Again, one of the features of CAS mediation is that if the parties do reach agreement, they can set that out in a settlement agreement. And once that's signed up to, it has binding effect of a contract. So Throughout the mediation, the process is voluntary. The parties can step, about, step away from the mediation process at any point if they feel it's not working, if there's no point continuing. But at the point where the parties reach agreement, that is then set out in a settlement agreement. And once that's signed up to it by the parties, you then have a binding agreement, a binding outcome to your dispute. If mediation fails, so if the mediator and the parties don't come to an agreement, if the, if the parties can't agree on an outcome to their dispute, then they can agree to submit the dispute to CAS arbitration. Now the default position is that the mediator cannot act as arbitrator, because I suppose it makes sense that if the mediator is having these one-sided conversations with parties, he or she will be privy to information that may not, the party may not necessarily want to disclose in an adversarial arbitration proceeding. So the, the, the rule is that a person who sits as a mediator under the CAS rules cannot then sit as arbitrator on that same dispute. However, there is again a caveat that the parties can expressly agree to it. So I suppose respecting the autonomy of the parties and the great deference given to the parties to agree to the extent they can how an arbitration is going to run, they can agree that yes, this mediator attempted to resolve our dispute with us. We are unsuccessful, but we want that same person to act as our arbitrator. So there is that, that possibility, if you like, for the MedARB procedure. So that in a very um, top level oversight is the an overview, if you like, of the CAS mediation rules. In terms then of just a couple of examples of mediations I was involved in, one of them was, was interesting because it really opened my eyes to the psychology of dispute resolution. And it was interesting, again, listening to Derek speak about the philosophy of sportsmen and sportswomen whose absolute reason for being is to win. And this idea of somehow settling or compromising jars with that starting ambit of I must win. Um, the case that, that the first mediation I, was, I want to speak about was a dispute between a football club and an agent. And the dispute really centered around the fact that the agent, his position was that the club owed him a fee and hadn't paid it. And the club's position was they, they didn't owe him anything. Um, in advance of the mediation meeting, the mediator held these one-sided conversations by telephone with each party to get an idea of what the issues were, what the main points were, and also again, to try and see what where the areas of concession might be. They The parties came to, to the CAS and we were all in a room the morning of the mediation, so the, the, the morning part of the session, if you like, was quite adversary. The both sides were very entrenched in their positions and it, it was hard watching. It was very hard to see how are these two sides going to come to any kind of agreement where they were, it was very black and white. One side said, you owe me money. The club said, no, we don't. So how do you find a resolution there? 
And the mediator did something very interesting in that over lunch, instead of asking the parties to withdraw to their recess rooms, he invited everybody to stay in the same room. So we all stayed in the same room and ate our lunch around the same table. And that created an incredible shift in dynamic. So instead of the people sitting there as strong adversaries, they were suddenly sitting at the table, eating a sandwich, drinking a cup of coffee and speaking about the weather. And Trino speaking about how did you get here? I took the train, I flew. And it really caused a shift, I think, in how they saw each other, that they weren't looking at each other as absolute entrenched adversaries. They were looking at each other as humans. How did you get here today? Would you like another sandwich? Who wants coffee? And when we went back into the afternoon session, the atmosphere had completely changed um, and the party settled quite soon after lunch. So that for me, it was just it was, it was a very interesting example of the need to step away from these very entrenched positions, the need to kind of get people to see each other as humans and to have a different understanding of what's going on. Um, the second dispute that I was involved in, which it started actually as it was a governance dispute where there was there was a dispute over who the proper president was of the federation, who was the properly elected president of a federation. Um, the case went to arbitration first and the parties then agreed to try mediation. Now, at the, at the point that the case went to arbitration, as you can imagine, the personal relationships had completely broken down. There was an absolute breakdown in relationships. Um, the parties agreed to go to mediation. We spent practically a full day at mediation. Um, and by contrast, in this case, both parties stayed in their rooms. So we didn't actually have any point where we were in the same room as the other side. We stayed in our rooms and the mediator shuttled back and forth trying to find out where the respective parties were, where areas of concession might be. We did get as far as drafting heads of agreement, um, but the, the, the parties couldn't agree the absolute terms of the agreement. So the, the, the mediation failed. A few weeks later, we were called for hearing. So we, we appeared before an arbitrator, so a different individual who acted as arbitrator. And at the outset of the hearing, so after the opening statements had been made, the parties asked for time to mediate. So we did, we withdrew into our rooms. Um, or sorry, at that point it was really a negotiation. We no longer had a mediator, but we entered into settlement negotiations and settled pretty much on very same terms as the terms which had been earlier negotiated in the mediation. So I think that's a, a it's an interesting example of even on the day when the mediation appeared to fail, you could see the value of it then a few weeks later when we went to arbitration, when we withdrew and, and, and negotiated and we ended up coming out to the place very close to where we'd been in terms of the, the, the mediation. Um, so that's my few minutes worth, if you like. And um, again, thank you very much to, to, to Mr. Dutta and to the organizers for asking me to speak here today. It's a pleasure to address uh, so many of you online on screen. And I very much look forward to the rest of the, the conversation and debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louis. Uh, I, I must say a very, very balanced overview and uh, uh, no matter uh, uh, what uh, we, we perceive from each other uh, in this world, I think your best comment was that we will continue to discuss issues and we will try and resolve them. I think Derek also must have got uh, some answer to uh, what he feels. Uh, and then I think Derek is not alone. There are many of us who feel that way. But I think um, one thing that is, uh, of course, you explained the CAS rules. And of course, we have uh, so many questions about CAS that keep arising in our mind from day to day. And uh, I think uh, your practical examples which you gave are very, very encouraging. In fact, in fact, that they, they go to the go to the very essence of mediation, you know and how the human psychology plays such a, such a role in, in the lives of people when, when, when they are sitting um, uh, you know, with, a, with a fixed mind and suddenly they let loose and, and then, then they start considering very, very positively. Thank you so much, uh, Louis. Uh, and our next speaker, um, uh, of course, today is another uh, absolutely a stalwart in his in his in, in the field of arbitration and sports, uh, in it is it is the Honorable Mr. Justice Graham Mew. Um, the Honorable Mr. Justice Graham Mew was appointed to the 
Ontario Superior Court of Justice in December 2013, previously he practiced as an advocate, arbitrator, and a mediator in Toronto with Clyde and Company, and in London as a member of Chambers at Four New Square. He holds law degrees from Kingston University, United Kingdom, and from the University of Windsor, Canada. He was a member of the bars of England and Wales, Middle Temple, 1982, Ontario, 1987, and British Columbia, 2010. His practice concentrated on civil litigation, insurance law, commercial arbitration, and mediation and sports disputes. He is the author of Law of Limitations, published by LexisNexis, currently in its third edition. He has been a judicial and appeals officer of World Rugby since 2001 and a member of World Rugby Anti-Doping Advisory Committee since its establishment in the year 2000. He was a member of the ad hoc panels of the Court of Arbitration for Sports at Commonwealth Games in 2010, New Delhi, and the Olympic Games in 2012 at London. He was president of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association from the year 2005 to the year 2007, and currently serves as a Director of Sports Dispute Resolution Center of Canada and Ontario Superior Court Judges Association. Mr. Justice Mew is, is, is an instructor at the Faculty of Law at Queen's University, Kingston, and is a bencher of the Honorable Society of the Middle Temple. So the participant, ladies and gentlemen, panelists, please let, let, let us now open the stage to Justice Mew and hear him. Justice Mew, we are all ears. Thank you. Good, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, welcome from um, Kingston, Ontario, where we're having um, uh, what we describe as an Indian summer. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful uh, late autumn day here. So um, although I, I, like Louise, I have very fond memories of the time that I spent uh, in India and uh, hope that uh, when the, uh, the current madness in the world subsides that I'll be able to, uh, to come back. Some very interesting comments from my colleagues so far and um, uh, I won't repeat what uh, Louise said, but uh, I, I now teach my uh, students at Queen's University about, uh, amongst other things, the CAS. And um, I share uh, Derek's um, view of the Semania decision. But I think it's important to remember uh, with the CAS that just like any other court, um, it's uh, uh, an independent arbitral body. And, and many of you will recall that the same body, the CAS, um, made what I think we would all regard as a very progressive decision in the case of an Indian act with Dutty Chan. And um, that case um, led uh, indirectly to World Athletics changing its rules, um, which uh, were challenged in the Sinania case. Uh, and uh, it was a two one split. Uh, one of my uh, Canadian judicial colleagues was on the panel, and I don't know if it's a great secret that he was the dissenter um, in, in that decision. So I, I think, just as with any other um, adjudicative body, um, uh, there are certain improvements that can be made, um, both the optics in terms of how that tribunal is, is, is regarded uh, as seen um, by its constituents. Uh, <clears throat> and also it's a substantive organization. Also very interesting, um, I, I followed the case in uh, Trinidad um, involving the, uh, the Soccer Association uh, and um, so some very profound um, issues of how sports disputes get resolved. Uh, essentially a court case was taken in Trinidad um, to, to um, to, to, to effectively, um, because the CAS process had been seen as um, prohibitive and, um, and, 
and is unfair. Uh, the, uh, the, the Soccer Federation, the Football Federation in Trinidad went to the court uh, and initially uh, was successful uh, in um, establishing the right of the, uh, of the local football federation to, um, to effectively sue FIFA in a domestic court. Uh, they didn't do so well in the Trinidad Court of Appeal, which uh, upheld the, uh, the jurisdiction of the Court of Arbitration for the Sport. And Derek, I don't know if the case is, is going up to the Privy Council. I saw there was some uh, some talk of that. So who knows? There may be another chapter in that story. But what it what it does illustrate um, is is as Derek and Louise have both underscored, it's just how uh, important sports. Uh, is in our lives and how important the resolution of sports disputes is. And generally speaking, and I say this now as a sitting judge, um, uh, courts are not well equipped to deal with sports disputes. Um, we don't move quickly enough. We don't have the expertise um, that, uh, that, that that's required. Uh, and, and I think it's difficult for uh, athletes in particular to be confident. Uh, that they will, um, they will get their uh, expeditious hearing uh, in a court of law. And in Canada, we uh, have progressed to the point where we now require, as a condition of sports organizations receiving funding from government, that they, that sports organizations, organizations do not resolve their disputes in court and that they go instead the Sport Dispute Resolution Centre of Canada, which is an independent um, tribunal, um, which provides mediation, arbitration, um, and and um, and now recently safeguarding um, uh, services to the uh, sports community uh, in Canada. And I'm going to devote most of the rest of my comments about some of the work that that organisation does. I think in mediation, um, and again, Derek and uh, Louise have both have touched on the, the cultural uh, issues, why mediation is, is sometimes a hard sell in sports because of the, uh, the culture of sports people. Uh, and often uh, in international sports, you also have a clash of different legal traditions. But it's important to remember that mediation is ultimately, as Derek indicated, a structured negotiation. It's a form of communication between parties uh, mediated by, uh, by a neutral person. And um, although some sports disputes are particularly challenging, you think of a selection dispute, for instance, to, to give Derek's win-lose analogy, if there's only one spot on the team available and there are, there's more than one person who, who, who claims to be entitled to that spot, Someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. And there is no there is no compromise. There will be a winner and there will be a loser. So, um, uh, you know, a, a sort of 50-50 midway solution is not possible in those circumstances. And that makes the mediation um, challenging. But on the other hand, mediation can uh, achieve negotiated, negotiated outcomes that, um, that an arbitration or a court decision cannot. And I'm going to give you a couple of uh, examples. Um, as Louise did with mediations, I was involved in where, where that occurred. Uh, before I do that, though, I just let me just very briefly um, describe the system that, that over 20 years or so we've evolved uh, in, in Canada. Um, there are essentially, and, 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 I, and I think our, our chairman uh, indi has indicated this four general areas of sports disputes, doping, uh, team selection, funding um, and athlete support, and a lot of countries provide financial support to their elite athletes. And then the sort of administrative governance issues that sometimes pit sports organizations who seem to have a real talent for uh, infighting, um, that, that, that pitch people within sports organizations against each other or sometimes athletes and coaches against sports organizations or the like. And they all present, uh, they all present uh, different challenges. We've developed um, a, a process with the Sport Dispute Resolution Center, and I should, uh, anyone's interested in, 
can find me out more about it, uh, I'll, um, I'll post in the message box uh, after I finish speaking the, uh, the website because you may find it interesting to take a look at the Justice, Justice, Justice Mew, uh, uh, yeah. one second. There is a slight uh, disturbance in the sound that we are getting. We are not uh, probably uh, you'll come a little closer to this uh, to the mic so that we can hear you clearly. I, I we are so keen to do that. Okay, if, if there continues to be a problem, let me know and I'll put a headset on. Is that sounding better? Okay, all right, my apologies for that. So, um, let me uh, we developed a, a process. Um, Parties, as Derek said, mediation is supposed to be a voluntary, um, a, a voluntary um, system where parties agree to, um, uh, to to try and negotiate a, a dispute. Um, but we we also have a process that we call resolution facilitation that is now built into every uh, sport dispute that goes to an arbitration solution, and it requires the parties. Um, in most cases, it's voluntary for, for both in cases, but in other cases, it's, it's mandatory for the parties to spend sometimes as little as an hour on the telephone with um, a mediator um, to, to essentially talk about the upcoming arbitration and see what the prospects for resolution are and whether the, the, the parameters of the dispute can be uh, narrowed. And, um, uh, so that's been relatively successful, and you may say, may be surprised to know that we um, use that process in doping cases. When we had our preparation session yesterday, we talked a little bit about the, the notion of plea bargaining um, uh, in criminal law and how that translates into doping cases. Uh, we've uh, had considerable success uh, with um, achieving uh, an agreed upon outcome uh, in doping cases. It's rarely the situation in doping cases that, that there's a dispute about whether an, an anti-doping rule violation has occurred. The, 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 the debate is nearly always about the sanction. Uh, and particularly now where sanctions can be modified if somebody provides substantial assistance, which enables the doping authorities to perhaps catch other dopers. Um, but the, the, the ability to have a, a resolution facilitation, as we call it, uh, has been very advantageous. Now, in the, in the two or three minutes that remain, let me just give you a couple of examples of mediations that, uh, that, that achieve the solution that an arbitration cannot have. One of the very first mediations that we did in Canada um, involved a team selection dispute. Uh, and I can tell you about it because it, it, the, the it became very public um, as a result of the, of the participants uh, speaking about it. The uh, complainant was uh, a very accomplished indigenous um, athlete. So when I say indigenous, she was um, uh, what we call a First Nations person, a mobile. Uh, and um, she was uh, having been on, on the, the gold medal winning uh, water polo team and Sydney Olympics, she was, she was removed from the team a couple of years later. And she said that she was removed, but the, the reason given was um, team incompatibility. And she said, this is not about team incompatibility. This is about racism. It's about uh, me being culturally different and not fitting in. And um, so she, she applied for, uh, which initially sued, and then it moved into uh, mediation. Uh, she wanted to be reinstated to the team. Um, in my um, wisdom, I decided that I'd better have all the team members uh, at the mediation, and we had a room full of uh, very powerful um, athletes uh, who all had uh, very strong opinions. But a little bit like the uh, Louise's um, description of how sitting around and having sandwiches and coffee and chatting in between formal sessions, uh, sessions helped break the ice. That sort of process evolved during the course of the day. Well, what was the solution? Because if this woman was going to be restored to the team, someone else would have to be thrown out. As the discussion went along, she came to realize that. She realized that reinstatement uh, of herself was, was, was not going to be um, viable. So 
what we turned our focus on was how some of the concerns she raised about what she saw as systemic racism or intolerance or lack of understanding of cultural differences uh, could be changed. And we ended the day with a very strong agreement on the part of all of the participants, and in particular the National Federation, to change its ways, to change its policies, to uh, extend uh, its, its um, uh, understanding and education of cultural differences. And, and essentially a protocol was put in place to uh, uh, guide uh, conduct in the future, which everyone went away happy with. Now, I've got about 30 seconds left by my time, so let me just tell you very quickly about the other one, but I think you'll find it uh, uh, very satisfactory from the sports perspective. Uh, there was a dispute uh, involving selection of a wrestler to the uh, Greco-Roman wrestling team that competed in the Commonwealth Games uh, a few years ago. And both uh, two athletes claimed that the rules hadn't been followed. Felt very strongly about it. And so um, there, there can only be um, one winner and one loser uh, in, if, if the matter had been adjudicated. What the participants decided to do ultimately was to have a wrestle-off. They decided that rather than go to an arbitrator, they would have a wrestling match against each other. In fact, it was the best of three and uh, that that would determine uh, who would be selected to the Commonwealth Games. It, it's the ultimate in a sports solution. Those are my comments. Uh, I look forward to hearing uh, the, the rest of the presentations and any discussion that follows. Thank you very much, Justice, uh, Justice Mew. Uh, I think uh, one very important point that you made, which of course we are all also grappling with and uh, uh, that is that the courts are not well equipped uh, with the expertise uh, uh, to decide the sports disputes. And I think uh, recently in India, many, many courts, uh, especially Delhi High Court in at least two decisions has uh, said the same thing, that we are not so equipped to decide and deal with these disputes. And also uh, one very interesting thing you mentioned about was the funding from the government. And I think that is another common aspect that we have. And uh, that's what is, 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 is uh, uh, sort of falling uh, on the Federation's independence to deal with the sport and uh, the government's interference as we want it to be reduced. Um, of course, uh, we want to come up to the level of the Olympic Charter and uh, we want to have, uh, of course, uh, in a country like India, uh, it's very difficult for sports uh, organizations to uh, have uh, the, the where, wherewithal to deal with uh, such a lot of, um, you know, um, land, equipment, and also athletes, etc. So the government does have uh, a policy and our constitutional provisions in the constitution also provide that the government will frame the policies and of course uh, finally we'll have to leave the federations independent and of course you raised the cultural issues and uh, also said that mediation can achieve a lot and then you also mentioned about the resolution facilitation that is voluntary and i think uh, that's also a good solution uh, of course uh, i think as louis mentioned earlier also in the cast rules now we understand that uh, mediation is the first step and then we, if, if the mediation fails, then we go into arbitration. Dear participants, uh, now uh, may I uh, bring you to our last speaker and uh, uh, who is uh, none other than our own very dear Justice Sikri, Justice Arjun Kumar Sikri. And uh, uh, let me uh, briefly introduce Justice Sikri to you all. And uh, of course, uh, the Indian participants are well aware of him, but uh, of course, the uh, participants from abroad. Uh, Justice Sikri did his BCom honors from University of Delhi in 1974 and two postgraduate diplomas in company law and administrative law from the Indian Law Institute in the years 1975, 1976. 
getting first position in both. He topped the LLB from Delhi University in the year 1977 and completed his master's in law in the year 1980. Again, getting first position in three years course. He was conferred the LLD honoris causa from Ram Manohar Lohia Law University, Lucknow in the year 2013. Justice Sikri started his practice in Delhi High Court in the year 1977 and handled all types of cases with specialization in arbitration, commercial, labor, and constitutional matters. He was counsel for various public sector undertakings, banks, financial institutions. He taught law in the Campus Law Center from the year 1984 to 1989. In the year 1997, he was designated as a senior advocate by the Delhi High Court. And in the year 1999, he became a judge of the Delhi High Court. And in the year 2011, he became the acting chief justice of Delhi High Court. In September 2012, he was elevated as the chief justice of Punjab and Haryana High Court. And in April 2013, he was appointed as judge of the Supreme Court of India. He superannuated in March 2019 as the senior most puny judge of the Supreme Court of India. Justice Sikri has authored over 4,700 judgments in different fields of law. He was chosen as one of the 50 most influential persons in the world who impacted the growth of intellectual property laws for the year 2007 by MIPA. He wrote many scholarly articles and learned papers. Currently, he is the judge of Singapore International Commercial Court, SICC, chairman of National Court Management Systems Committee, NCMS, chairman, chairperson of the committee for formulating an action plan for online dispute resolution, Niti Aayog, uh, that's the policy making body of the government of India. He is uh, chairman of News Broadcasting Standards Authority, NBSA, chairperson, interim advisory council, Delhi School of Public Policy and Governance, DSPNG, University of Delhi, and ombudsman of Federation of Indian F Fantasy Sports, FIFS. He is also the visiting professor of various law universities. Over to you, Justice Sikri. We are all awaiting for you to give us your comments today. Thank you, Mr. Rajiv, for your such a generous uh, introduction, which was not needed. Anyway, I am beholden to you for that. Uh, my uh, greetings to all my fellow pe panelists and uh, to all the organizers. And a good evening to all the participants who have come in large number. Here are their registrations, and uh, which I can see that uh, many of them are participating. And uh, it's a very interesting topic. I should first congratulate you for uh, organizing uh, uh, a discussion on uh, mediation in sports matters. That is very uh, topical and uh, very important in today's day, in particularly insofar as India is concerned, because of various reasons, which uh, I'll try to demonstrate uh, over next 10, 12 minutes, which uh, uh, I have been given to address. Uh, what I gather at the outset, let me make these remarks. What I gather from uh, the my three distinguished speakers who have spoken, there are two very, very important takeaways among so many others, but the two which I would like to highlight and then uh, would start uh, insofar as relevance of uh, those takeaways insofar as India is concerned. First thing which uh, Justice Graham you said and uh, Rajiv also uh, summarized uh, that, uh, that the courts are not well equipped to decide disputes as far as uh, sports disputes are concerned. Another, of course, on that there is uh, some uh, uh, difference of opinion which we saw. Derek Murray says that uh, insofar as CAS is concerned, here CAS is what it is uh, the uh, uh, arbitration body 
that the sports uh, cases which uh, go to them and uh, the uh, manner in which the arbitration took place takes place and uh, he had his some of his reservation of course louis uh, tried to allay those uh, 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 apprehensions uh, which uh, he had but what i am trying to say here is that to some extent and this i'll try to make it good later uh, to some extent uh, there is some reservation in so far as resolution of disputes either by the court process or by arbitration is concerned and in this whole process mediation assumes great significance and all the three speakers have uh, uh, stated what are the important what is the importance of mediation in so far as sports cases are concerned we have seen actually the disputes as far as sports disputes are concerned they are of different nature i need not repeat that because that has been said time and again but uh, what is important is that uh, these uh, uh, as far as relationships in sports are concerned they are different from other commercial relationships although in uh, uh, commercialization of sports also in uh, has uh, come in which uh, involves influx of money etc and that it has given rise to various other kinds of uh, issues and disputes etc that's a different thing but what is even today it is important is that uh, sports uh, as uh, derek said in the beginning itself uh when he compared sports with the the uh, uh, mediation that sports is one thing where everybody wants to win so there two uh, sports persons who are competing with each other whether they are two teams or two players who are competing with each other they take their positions because both of them want to win it is but as against that mediation is a win win situation where both come together and they want to find a solution if there some disputes are arisen but what he highlighted was level level playing field which is created by various means and i'll add to that that mediation is one such process which facilitates level playing field so that the competition which is there uh, between the two parties they may be called uh, two sports teams etc may be called warring parties but then they Uh, at the same time we recognize that uh, as far as sports is concerned it is and in respect of cricket it is said it is a gentleman's game so it is given that stature and we normally use this phrase uh, when we want to uh, 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 say somebody that look you should have sportsman spirit so this kind of spirit so th this is the this is what is the importance which is attached to the sports this is the culture of the sport and because of so many reasons today and all these kinds of issues which arise whether these issues may be for selection of teams for a, a particular uh, uh, athlete or particular sportsman in that particular game not selected in the team or whether it is a doping whether it is sharing of revenue uh, in so far as organizers are concerned whether it is uh, uh, even uh, say uh, sponsoring the teams etc the issues may arise between them and there some issues have arisen and uh, there have been issues apart from that uh, uh, issues of uh, as particularly in india in these body sports bodies issues of elections issues of corruption in sports and when all this takes place and the uh, process when it is gone into the due process itself comes into uh, 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 picture and another aspect which uh, i would like to add is the uh, which we have seen in india particularly the cases of that kind gender discrimination and sexual exploitation may there are many such cases which have come that the coach had tried to indulge in such uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, kind of practices and that there there were some complaints against them and uh, so therefore what i'm trying to say is that the issues in respect of sports which is highlighted by my predecessor speakers also are of a different nature at the same time what is more important is that these issues need to be resolved immediately they cannot wait even for few days sometimes if some game is going on and that is why many sports bodies have their ad hoc 
committees and uh, those ad hoc judges or uh, the whether the, you call them arbitrator or mediators they are there in the events as justice graham we were told that he uh, he was here in 2010 uh, uh, commonwealth games so therefore th that need is there because it, we need a uh, on the spot resolution so what i'm trying to say is when we talk of on the spot resolution it is neither the court system nor the, uh, that is litigation nor arbitration system which can uh, deal with this effectively that is one reason and here when we talk of uh, mediation and uh, uh, let me uh, say here louis gave very nice example when she talked about one mediation case that during lunch that uh, uh, the, the mediator asked both the parties to sit together and have lunch with him when they were sitting on one table and uh, 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 they had their lunch and they had their coffee together and they were discussing weather or their uh, uh, journey etc coming to that place so the entire atmosphere changed this is the uh, uh, i would say the best policy or the best trait of a mediation what i call it if i may say and when why disputes arise because in any society conflicts would arise there, there cannot be i mean a, a society without conflicts but the what we want is the early resolution and peaceful resolution of those conflicts and why uh, mediation is one such uh, 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 process which goes into the reasons why disputes have arisen and it not only looks into the past but it looks into the future also so that the relationship between the parties is maintained so going by that example which louis gave that two parties sitting across the uh, negotiating table and discussing i call it a position from i versus you because we have the habit of taking our positions when we go to the court or we go to the arbitration which are adjudicatory processes then we take our position and i think i am right you think you are right but on a negotiating table on a uh, mediation table where there is a, a third uh, person who is a neutral and is facilitating the mediation process a mediator this is this is converted from i versus you to we we are now sitting together when we sit on that table i see your point of view also you see my point of view also and this is the situation of which i call a synergy which takes place and it brings about uh, wonderful results that is the process of mediation which needs to be there and as uh, i i say that discussions are always better than arguments because an argument is to find out who is right and a discussion is to find out what is right so from who is right to what is right in that kind of situation it is only the mediation which uh, uh, brings about that is it heals the past it lives in the present and it dreams the future when we see these kinds of the advantages of uh, 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 the mediation now very interestingly if we see in indian context because we are discussing that mediation has taken off in india it started with the amendment in the civil procedure code with the insertion of section 89 in the year 2002 first uh, uh, i mean uh, the uh, thereafter within 3 years first pilot project of mediation and at that time it was a structured interactive mediation which derek also Uh, gave that definition of mediation this started uh, only 15 years ago we talk about mediation in india in the form of panchayats we say that we we go give a very nice example of krishna going to korvas and he tried to mediate before going for war since korva did not agree and therefore war took place but then the kind of structured scientific method of mediation uh, present kind of mediation it is in india it's at a nascent stage but good thing is that in last 15 years it has really come up <coughs> and today mediation is here to stay it is uh, uh, in the beginning i still remember in 2005 when the first mediation center was set up in as a project pilot project 
undertaken by the Supreme Court and the center was set up in these Azari, lawyers boycotted. They protested. They even ransacked that mediation room, I still remember, when Chief Justice of India had to come. But today, it is the acceptability, particularly among lawyers, is so, I mean, fascinating and so encouraging. So in 15 years, we have come a long way. Then, but the mediation has, by and large, has remained uh, 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 what we call court annex mediation, the cases which are in the court, and uh, they are referred for mediation to mediation centers, etc. We are now enlarging the scope and uh, uh, the, the canvas on which the mediation should take place, including pre-mediation here. And therefore, we are going, and the, traditionally, it is the say matrimonial cases or commercial cases or other kinds of cases which are referred. <clears throat> but the time has now come to have the mediation in these uh, particular fields also. And here, the mediation in sports, because of all these peculiar features, it becomes very, very important. I, I still remember, in, uh, uh, if we, uh, I'll come to that and uh, I'll give a few examples of Indian uh, courts which have taken up the cases and what would have been the position if it would have been, a, uh, I mean, mediation in the, in, instead of uh, uh, litigation. Uh, but before that, if I remember there's only one case. I was just, uh, uh, although it was not mediation in that sense, but uh, in loose sense mediation. Quite a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago or so, Delhi Ranji team was selected. In, in Ranji is a league, cricket league, uh, which is played. And for Delhi, which had to participate and team was selected. And on selection, there was a dispute. Now, before this dispute could go to the court, which every time it goes, such disputes. But in that case, at that time, Mr. Arun Jaitley, we know our uh, uh, one of the most uh, established and distinguished lawyers and uh, uh, politicians uh, in this country, uh, who unfortunately passed away last year. He was asked to mediate, and he could bring out about a solution within one day. And the Zanji team, nobody, everybody accepted the uh, as well as thereafter the team, and it was a win-win situation which was created by that. Another example, not in India, but which I, apart from other, the examples which uh, others have given, as I remember, it is Woodhall Warren case, which uh, Louis or Graham or uh, Murray would be knowing. So Wood, Woodhall, who was a uh, uh, middleweight, uh, uh, this uh, uh, bo boxer, boxer. boxer, and uh, he, this Warren was his uh, uh, promoter. And uh, they had a contract between them. He refused to play, maybe on the terms which were stated in the contract. But then, good thing is that that uh, instead of going to the court, that case had gone for mediation, and uh, it settled, and they uh, came out with a new contract. So it was that kind of win-win situation which had taken place. And uh, therefore, this uh, uh, I had read somewhere that Dominique Bray, who was uh, Warren's lawyer. He said at that time that uh, mediation in sports is being accepted with open arms. That was uh, his, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, comment after this med uh, successful mediation. Now, so therefore, time has come, as far as India is concerned, to have specialized mediations, and it includes sports mediation as well. Now, COVID situation in our country, or it worldwide, this COVID pandemic, has given us a, another Philip or a chance. Of course, it is one uh, uh, pandemic which has created panic all over the world. As I always say, the three aspects which are totally affected are lives, people are dying, livelihood, many have been uh, rendered unemployment, and lifestyle. That lifestyle today also, instead of having this in-person physical uh, uh, program, we are all sitting on and having it visual program. So with mask and social distancing, so lives, lifestyle and uh, livelihood, which are affected because of the TLs, uh, because of this. But then uh, in the whole process, we have also realized that technology can play a very, very important role. And uh, ODR, which is the online dispute resolution, which is now uh, 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 is seen as a next step 
even in Indian legal system, whether it is arbitration, whether it is litigation, whether it is mediation. And according to me, some of the cases through mediation, which are apt or uh, which are very proper on online mediation, apart from consumer disputes are the sports disputes. As uh, uh, Mr. Datta said about, uh, in, he, uh, uh, about my, when he was reading my CV, he said that I am the ombudsman of uh, FIFS, fantasy sports, uh, this thing. So this is where the players, they play, uh, of course, it's a, uh, uh, fantasy game and sports that they play and then they win money. But if there are disputes, then uh, they, these disputes are settled. They come to me and I settle. But what I'm trying to say is that even in these uh, 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 kinds of bodies, etc., what is uh, felt and what is uh, uh, being highlighted is that it is not necessary to go to court. There should be a self-regulation. And here, mediation plays a very, very important role in the whole process. And therefore, uh, 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 this uh, uh, it was also said ODR, uh, the, 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 I'm the uh, ch uh, chairman of the advisory committee, Niti Aayog is looking into that and we are coming about uh, with this. Today, uh, because of all and ODR and COVID situation, it has been felt and particularly uh, after the Singapore convention, uh, which came into force uh, in this September 2020 itself, which was um, uh, initiated last year in 2019 and has been on ancestral rules. And it is going to be a game changer because the even international disputes of any kind when they are settled through mediation, like in arbitration when we have this uh, Geneva or uh, New York convention. So under the Singapore convention, when the parties sign that mediation uh, in one country or wherever it happens will be accepted in other country like an arbitration award. So it is going to be a game changer. And in this scenario, when mediation is taking place, such uh, uh, proper and good routes, I think in India, we should now gear up and should start how we can uh, uh, do uh, mediation in these. I, I think uh, I need not go further because uh, I have already uh, I mean, over on my time, I wanted to give some of the examples, but I'll uh, rest at that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice Sikri. And I think uh, the, the catch point in what you have said, of course, uh, is who is right to what is right is, is, is what we are trying to uh, absolutely find out. And, and uh, the courts, of course, as you said, are not so well equipped and you have mentioned uh, some of the cases, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the important thing in mediation, and as you also rightly referred to how Derek started by saying that the sportsmen want to win, but they want to win on a level playing field. And on the spot decisions of mediation are absolutely a must. And that's what helps sports in growing because disputes will be everywhere. And uh, we, this, this society cannot be without disputes. And uh, um, I think we have uh, had a very long, long session. A lot of uh, things have been said. And I think uh, a, a, a few questions uh, which, which have, have come through, but I think uh, very, very um, uh, before, before, we, before I hand over to Arun uh, for his closing remarks, May I just uh, put uh, two or three very uh, uh, simple questions, which 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 uh, most of the people have. Uh, I mean, we have gathered them from a lot of questions which uh, people want to ask. And one of the questions that any one of uh, the panelists from, um, uh, let's say, Lewis or Derek or Justice Mew, one question that uh, is in the mind of many people is. How do you in the West and other parts of the world consider the idea of court appointed mediations? Any, anyone can take that question. Um, well, maybe, maybe, maybe as, a, as, a, as a court person, I, I'll take a stab at that. Um, again, uh, we've, we've had a, a mediation as part of our court process probably for 25 years now. And indeed, um, in, in Toronto, which is our biggest court center in Canada, 
um, uh, parties are required to have a mediation session before they can set an action down for trial uh, or, or, or obtain an exemption through the court. Um, it, it's often said that a mandatory mediation system is an oxymoron, um, but, uh, that mediation can only work if it's interest-based and if it's um, voluntary. And certainly the settlement rates in voluntary mediation are higher than they are where mediation is mandated by the courts, but not significantly higher. Uh, for, for all the reasons that have been discussed by the speakers today, once people are put in a room together, um, and, and sometimes, as Louise explained, they're not always together. Sometimes their, their enmity is such that they have to be kept apart, and the mediator plays a, a shuttle diplomacy role. But, but once you put people in a position of having to communicate and it's not in the set piece of a courtroom, um, there is usually progress that can be made, even if it's just having a better understanding of the case that you're going to have to meet in court. So uh, I, I'm a fan of, um, of mediation. Uh, I think it takes disputes that don't need to be adjudicated out of the system. Uh, and even if those disputes stay in the system, the parties go into court with a better understanding. Thank you very much. Uh, any, and, and Louis, uh, any comments on that? Uh, yes, um, I think Ireland, similar to, to Canada, there's been some development to encourage mediation in Ireland. And specifically, the Irish government brought in the Mediation Act in 2017. And by virtue of art of sections 14 and 15 of that 2017 Act, before legal counsel, so before either a solicitor or a barrister commences proceedings on behalf of a client, he or she has to set out to the client the possibility of going through mediation as a means of resolving the dispute. So it's too early really to see what impact that has had, but at least the legislative framework is there that now before commencing any procedure in the Irish courts, there is a positive obligation on the solicitor or where the barrister is acting without a solicitor to inform the client about the possibility of mediation. So at least, it creates awareness of it. the client at least turns their mind to the possibility of mediating this, the dispute before going into a fully adversarial court litigation. Thank you. Uh, Derek, uh, do you have any comment on that? Derek, you are muted. Yep, sorry. Yes, um, yes. I know that um, this is being uh, tried in, in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, that there is such a large backlog of cases before the courts that they, from time to time, have projects that do uh, a batch of, of mediations as, as opposed to, to going through the court process. Um, I'm sorry I don't have um, particular facts and figures to, to give you, but while I have the, the floor, uh, Mr. Mediator, I just want to say um, to my other uh, colleagues on, on the panel um, to thank them for their, their contributions. Uh, I, I think overall this has reinforced my optimism, certainly, that uh, sport is unique and will continue to throw up role models and be a catalyst and motivation uh, for making uh, and achieving goals where, wherever they may be. And I'm heartened by the, the other uh, colleagues' comments that by discussion, like webinars like this, uh, that we will go forth and uh, be productive. And I, I trust that everyone who participated uh, has them and their families uh, stay safe during this, this COVID period. And, and who knows, maybe we will meet up in the Bahamas next year, if, if possible. <laughs> Surely. Uh, one, one last uh, one, one comment I want from Justice Sikri. Uh, sir, you, you have already, you, you, are, you are muted, sir. So uh, as you have already mentioned, that uh, there are disputes, of course, the, the power of Article 32 and 226 under the Constitution is very vast with the courts. When the disputes for sports are going to the courts, and today there are very many federations, even Indian Olympic Association, it has set up a disciplinary committee, et cetera, et cetera. 
why is it that the courts are not keen to first send these disputes straight away to mediation of course we are awaiting the um, stand alone law for mediation and probably you could influence that in that law we have a a, a chapter relating to mediation on sports uh, where uh, it could be only through mediation see i think it's a very valid question uh, mr rajiv which you have raised uh, what i can say is there may be two reasons for that number one the uh, philosophy of the judge itself so there are uh, judges uh, who have been encouraging med mediation and whenever such cases come they try that yes the cases should be uh, i mean they, they they will tell the parties to uh, that the cases should be sent for me mediation and you first uh, take a chance there and many kinds of cases have been sent by various uh, judges there is no doubt about it in so far as sports cases are concerned what i feel uh, find is that uh, maybe occasion has not arisen because of that second reason as you rightly mentioned sometimes the disputes are such that uh, a writ petition is filed uh, either under article 226 or 32 so therefore there are there's some constitutional issues which have been raised and once there are constitutional issue raised it may not have occurred i'm not saying uh, I, i it may not have occurred that such case could also be sent because they uh, many times you people as lawyers you know because the ingenuity of the lawyers is uh, unbound and but uh, in, in order to file the writ petition they will raise some constitutional aspect which may not be very necessary or uh, very genesis of a dispute and because ultimately at the end of the day the two parties to a dispute they want resolution of the dispute they don't want a very brilliant judgment on uh, whether uh, a sports body like bcci is an uh, 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 i mean state under article 226 or not this is not no concern of the parties this may be the concern of lawyers and whether writ petitions are maintainable or not as far as parties are concerned they only want resolution of their disputes exactly. so therefore maybe it's a very good idea which you have said and i think uh, there may be some good uh, 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 webinar or seminar of this kind where the judges should also be uh, to some extent we have some of the judges who are really good in supreme court who are for mediation uh e committee chairman today justice chandrachur dr chandrachur is uh, again uh, 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 forward looking uh, yes and justice call who is uh, heading uh, the mediation and consultation committee with justice uh, um, i think he is heading or justice rohinton nariman is heading and the third person is justice indu malhotra so all of them are uh, there they, they, they have passion for mediation there is no doubt about it and but this message should go i was just uh, remembering one of the examples which i wanted to give was a case came before me and it was uh, bcci although it was telecast rights etc that it had a contract with world sports group and uh, which was uh, 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 i think contract was rescinded way back in 2009 and uh, the, of course there was an arbitration clause so matter went for arbitration arbitrator uh, the arbitral uh, tribunal uh, passed some interim arrangement they have fixed but then it was challenged and till 2014 15 16 the matter was pending in the supreme court to decide this issue so interim arrangement etc so it takes 5 6 years only on interim so that is the uh, time which the arbitration can also take even if the matter has gone for arbitration so yes. therefore <clears throat> such cases if we can find a fast resolution to mediation and as we always say win win situation actually uh, i tell you in uh, we have two types of cases as far as sports are concerned one is yes which are concerning the sports bodies in the sense that players not team selection doping and uh, other things but then we have lots of disputes about the administration of the sports bodies also about their elections also Election. about corruption scams etc all those kinds of things so which you fall in a different category altogether so some of these category of disputes they cannot be through mediation they have to be through adjudication if suppose um, uh, uh, the case of uh, some corruption or scam 
and some uh, FIR is filed and uh, it is before the criminal court, it has to be gone into like that only. That, that mm -hmm. can't be settled through mediation. But at the same time, like when we were discussing yesterday only and Mr. Neshwar Gupta mentioned, or I think, yeah, uh, Mr. Ajeev Gupta, you only mentioned about plea bargaining. Yes, so right. some of the cases, even in the criminal procedure court, a plea bargaining, I always say, is a, in criminal cases, it's a form of mediation. So if you say in loose sense, we can call it a mediation in criminal cases. And okay. of course, so therefore such cases are also many of these cases in this category are also capable of settling. If uh, they, uh, uh, even under our criminal procedure code, there are certain cases which are compoundable, certain kind. If they fall in that category and uh, therefore they can be also be settled. So therefore there is a vast scope as far as settlement is concerned. Yes, sensitization of judges is needed uh, as far well as your question is concerned. Um, I was just wanting to ask one more last question and that will go to Lewis and, and Justice Mew. Um, you know, uh, CAS, of course, the seat of CAS is Lausanne. And uh, whatever decision is rendered by CAS, it goes before the courts in Switzerland in Lausanne. And uh, therefore, uh, the rest of the world, anybody wants to challenge that decision, they have to go to Lausanne. And sometimes the court in Lausanne have a very limited approach to, uh, like in any arbitration um, law also, very limited uh, aspects they look into. And uh, if it is against the public policy of Switzerland, then of course, that uh, uh, that that uh, award will be set aside. Why is it that uh, you know? Uh, of course, every country, every uh, sportsman ranked to every country. That country also has a sovereign, and it has also has its uh, public policy. So we are now just now bound only with Switzerland's public policy as far as gas is concerned. Do you have any comment on that, Louis? Louise is looking at me and I'm looking at Louise. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Ajib. You, you, you saved, I think, your most complex question for last. Um, I mean, just to say you're absolutely right that the seat of all CAS arbitrations is Lausanne. So that means that where a party wants to challenge an arbitration, and as you pointed out, those challenges are made on very narrow procedural grounds. So one of the bedrock principles of arbitration, if you like, is that the award is final and binding on the parties, save for the very narrow procedural grounds on which it can be the award can be challenged in the case of Swiss awards to the Swiss Federal Tribunal under the Swiss Private International Law Act. Um, I mean, the question you raise as to whether the Swiss Federal Tribunal should have regard to both international public policy and Swiss public policy is a very interesting one. I think similar to a constitutional argument made before an Irish court where a party raises a, a, a question of public policy, it's really kind of a last ditch argument it's where they, they can't fit their arguments under either jurisdiction or a violation of the right to be heard or some irregularity in the constitution of the tribunal. Um, from, from memory, I think the case of the, the footballer Methuselah was the first Swiss, was the first CAS award where the Swiss federal tribunal set aside part of the award on the grounds of, of Swiss public policy. Um, as to whether the Swiss courts would also take into account international public policy, the short answer is, I don't know. I mean, I think it's certainly, certainly if you are a, a, an Indian party coming before the Swiss Federal Tribunal, and if it's a case where both parties are Indian, and your point is, look, this award is really in clear violation of Indian public policy, then as to whether that argument will be successful, I don't know, but I think it's it's certainly an argument worth making. Um, where in circumstances there, where the award itself is going to be sought to be enforced in India. Thank you, thank you so much. Before I before I close, this only one thing I want to mention, and I think Derek, that will interest you, that there has been a mediation between the West Indies cricket team and the BCCI, which I dug out with my research. And I must say that, uh, you know, the president of the West Indies Cricket Board, Dave Cameron, and it was, it was when, when the West Indies cricket team decided to abandon the rest of the 
series in India that he said, and he said very, uh, very well, that we would like to resolve this dispute through dialogue, facilitated or otherwise with aim of jointly coming up with appropriate cricketing solutions. I, I really, really was so fascinated by this that there has already been something between the, the West Indies cricket team and the Indian cricket team. And uh, now I think uh, I, we, we've really taken a lot of time. I think uh, I'll hand over to Arunashwar for, uh, uh, for his comments, closing comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, this was really uh, amazing and a fascinating international webinar where almost a thousand participants registered themselves and a large number has attended. The glory of this enthusiasm goes to our panel of speakers whose wide experience and outstanding brilliance is spread out globally and that has kept everyone awestruck, fascinated and mesmerized today. Though I represent the Sports Disputes Resolution Center of India, but I take this opportunity to thank you all, panelists, registrants, and participants, on behalf of Supreme Court mediators, Commonwealth Law Association, and Youth Bar Association of India. When the first human being threw a stone at an animal to shoo him, or to get a fruit from the tree, or ran with his siblings and friends, to test his skills, sports was created. Sports is a disciplined, synchronized, and rigorous physical activity involving human body, mind, and will within the framework of rules for organized participation. It helps in developing integrity of character, confidence, self-reliance, self of well-being. It teaches how to work as a part of team, how to manage success and disappointments, and how to respect each other. Sports is entertainment of Hollywood and Bollywood with military precision. A live entertainment. You lose your focus for a fraction and you lose your gold or you're back to the pavilion. The wow factor leads to the rise of adrenaline and the TRP. And that is where the money is. And when money is, there is disputes. When there are disputes, there has to be mechanism for dispute resolution. And that is what we have all talked about and heard today. My thanks to Derek Murray for being with us in this early morning, almost 8.30 Trinidad time. Derek has evolved as the most experienced and acclaimed mediator and arbitrator over the years. And that we have felt in his address today. The credit goes all to his great wicket-keeping skills, while Andy Roberts and Malcolm Marshall were attacking with full fury, sometimes at Indians also. I think he uses the same sad skill in collecting the facts hurled at him by the advocates and he smoothened them into meaningful settlement and awards. His particular reference to existing of big brother and small brother in sports, re sports resolution needs serious consideration. Thank you, Murray, for being with us today. I thank Louis Reilly for sharing us her very wide experience in regulatory and disciplinary matters before domestic and international tribunals, particularly an experience as a mediator. Her observation on absence of bias in sports disputes, particularly in view of successive decisions against IOC, were extremely pertinent. She took us through the CS rules, and that will be very meaningful for us in times to come. Thank you, Louis for a wonderful address to the August gathering, sharing our experience and understanding of the range of disputes that arise between the various stakeholders in the sports industry. It was really a great pleasure to have Justice Graham Mew from Canada with us. We made him wake up in the wee hours and join us early morning, 7.30 a.m. Canada time. He has a wide experience over two decades as a sports mediator and arbitrator and the judge on the panel of courts of arbitration for sports dispute resolution center. He has, I see in this website, and it, it speaks a lot about uh, the information on disputes relating to sports. 
it was also evident from his ad address and it was really pleasure to hear justice mew's outstanding and fascinating address on the subject thank you justice mew my very personal thanks to justice arjun k sikri who is a great enthusiast and really and readily agreed to be with us today on this inaugural session his enthusiasm was evident in his very passionate address his simplicity effortlessness and in depth learning has always been a boon and blessing for the legal institution it was a treat to a treat to hear him and see his vision and way forward with respect to the three nascent industries in india sports dispute resolution by private courts using mediation as a tool and that too by an online process but all this is irreversible and choiceless we are in the fourth industrial revolution globalization 4.0 and as i call we are also in the legal in legal revolution 5.0 i am certain that under this guidance niti ayog will be able to implement it all at the ground level soon thank you justice sikri for enlightening us today we look forward to your backing and your support as we have taken up the venture of sport resolution sport dispute resolution by promoting and providing the necessary platform for online dispute resolution to all the stakeholders in the industry when i was drafting the sports act for rajasthan we came across a list of more than 60 stakeholders in the sport industry other than the players his emphasis on going to the root of the dispute and believe me and what justice sikri said that all disputes are finally resolvable if we move from i versus you to we situation my extreme thanks to justice sikri my thanks to shivan thiru vice president commonwealth law association australasia hub rakesh kanna former president of supreme court bar association rajiv datta and jitend mohan sharma both former vice presidents of supreme court bar association and all senior advocates at supreme court they hold the flag of supreme court mediators and carry it on their broad broad shoulders with meticulous precision they have been the rock foundation of this webinar my thanks to sampreet ajmani a young advocate at supreme court representing the youth bar association of india and finally my, my thanks to the man behind the scene silently naturally inconspicuously and effectively coordinating it all the sutradhar of this webinar r santhana krishnan former president of commonwealth law association and last but not the least thank to rahul kumar for his, and his team for providing the technical support in holding this webinar and making it a great success we are going to hold a series of webinars on various topics related to sports industry and look forward to see you all again and again to be enlightened and seek enlightenment thank you all for being with us thank you